So it gives me um, great pleasure this morning to introduce Dean uh, Dennis Charney, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks. Thank you. It's a special honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Elicio Perez Stable to Mount Sinai. Uh, for many reasons, uh, but in particular, I look forward to learning uh, because of his enormous expertise in minority health and health disparities. And, and that's an area that Mount Sinai is unequivocally uh, committed to uh, advancing, uh, learning, and, and doing a better job. Uh, Dr. Perez Stable is the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institute of Health. He, he directs the Institute's $281 million budget that is designed to conduct research and uh, enhance training, uh, increase research capacity, and infrastructure development uh, related to public education and dissemination uh, programs, to ultimately to improve minority health and reduce health disparities. Uh, the NIMH the, as it is abbreviated, is the lead organization at the NIH for planning, reviewing, coordinating, and evaluating minority health and health disparities um, and uh, related to research activities, training, and so forth, as I've mentioned. Dr. Perez Stable's expertise spans a broad range of health disparities disciplines. His research interests have centered on improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among healthcare professionals, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research workforce, all areas that are very important to us. Recognized as a leader in Latino healthcare and disparities research, he has spent more than 30 years leading research on smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in Latino populations uh, throughout the United States and Latin America. Prior to becoming the director of NIMHD, uh, Dr. Perez Stable was a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He had other major roles at UCSF, including directing the UCSF Center for Aging in Diverse Communities, uh, which was funded by the National Institute of Aging. And he was also director of the UCSF Medical Effectiveness Research Center for Diverse Populations. He was elected to the National uh, Academy of Medicine, which is the lead, leading uh, organization uh, in the country uh, for uh, uh, physicians and, uh, and other researchers and policy leaders, uh, and this organization, which many Mount Sinai uh, you know, faculty are members of, uh, provides important advice to the United States government and other leading agencies in important uh, areas related to biomedical research and care. So that's a, that's a, a, real, a very important honor that he has received. He's earned his BA in chemistry from the University of Miami as well as his MD from the University of Miami uh, School of Medicine, and he completed his primary care internal medicine residency at UCSF. Let's give a big welcome uh, to Dr. Perez Stable and welcome him to Mount Sinai. So th thank you for the kind introduction, and it's delighted to be here uh, today. Um, I'm going to present to you about uh, NIMHD and try to address um, uh, what we can do or what we should be doing to reduce health disparities in the healthcare setting. So um, already heard about what we're supposed to do, and I think I want to emphasize NIMHD focuses on minority health and health disparities, and I'll make those distinctions. Um, and we will go over what that means in terms of racial ethnic groups. Uh, to try to understand causes for why things happen uh, is really a fundamental part. 
Um, you know, disparities research, everyone says, well, we spent all this time describing, let's do something about it. And I don't disagree with that at all, but we, we have to know what to do. And in order to know what to do, we have to know what's causing uh, the things that we're observing and see what we need to, uh, what, where we need to intervene. We're also very interested in communicating to the general public um, and also uh, foster innovation and collaboration with other institutes. Um, we are very committed to diversity in the scientific workforce as an institute, although we do not have um, uh, much in the way of training programs, but I think this is a good time to be addressing this important and critical issue uh, on the national agenda, and NIH has made a strong commitment for that. So when I <clears throat> refer to minority health, I'm referring to any distinctive characteristics of with each of the race, racial ethnic groups. It doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome is worse, which is what everyone assumes is the case. So there are uh, factors that actually the outcomes are better for a racial ethnic minority group, or there are characteristics that one needs to study intra-group, and this is what we're defining as minority health. Uh, minorities in general are united by a certain amount of uh, common theme of being at social disadvantage and subject to discrimination, and of course are historically underrepresented in the biomedical uh, research and usually in the scientific workforce. Not always the case, but usually. These are the groups that you're familiar with, um, OMB, uh, Office of Management and Budget, which uh, defines these, and we are tied to this definition. This is, this is what drives part of our agenda. Um, African American or black, Asian, which is very heterogeneous, American Indian or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, I'll point out that frequently this is lumped together with Asian, and that is wrong. I mean, people at NIH do it all the time to re because this is a very small group. This is like the American Indian population, very small and hard to get a representative sample. And of course, Latino or Hispanic, which is my self-identity, and which is a heterogeneous yet mixed group. Be forewarned, the census is likely to change some things for 2020. They're in the process of uh, doing that. Um, health disparity, um, for me, for our perspective, fundamentally includes another component, uh, often low socioeconomic status. In fact, that is the other fundamental pillar or individuals or groups of people who are also subject to discrimination and who also have poor health outcomes. So when you talk about a disparity, we're really referring to a, a worse outcome for a particular condition driven in our perspective by either your minority status or um, low socioeconomic status uh, uh, condition, usually measured by formal years of education or income. Um, Rural populations are also in our legislation. This is related to government uh, decisions, not necessarily automatic, although one can make a case uh, for rural populations. And sexual gender minorities, or LGBTQ, are in discussion about being included in this, uh, in this uh, definition as well, not yet resolved. Uh, and this is something that uh, to be continued. AHRQ, people think, uh, identify disparity populations, but actually the Congress authorizes me, the director of NIMHD, to make that decision. Of course, I don't think Dr. Collins would agree with uh, me just deciding unilaterally. Um, but be that as it may, the uh, legislation says that I'm supposed to consult with the director of ARC in order to do this. ARC has, um, legislate, has been legislated to focus on priority populations. So they don't call them disparity populations. As you can see from this list, it includes almost everyone uh, except white guys. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, it loses its meaning, in my view, to say, well, these are the ones we're focusing on. And already minorities are almost 40% of the U.S. population. Um, so back to a definition of health disparity is the difference that adversely affects a disadvantaged population. So again, the saying is that if um, white men have more heart attacks, that's not a disparity, it's a difference. Um, and, and it's based on important outcomes. And the science of figuring out why this happens, what influences this, um, both from a social, environmental, uh, cultural, individual, and biological perspective is what NIMHD science uh, is. And because this is a scientific area that has really emerged over the last uh, 
you know, 25 years or so, um, it isn't quite mainstream and people aren't quite sure what we mean. But I believe this is a good time to, uh, to put some uh, traction on, 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 that, uh, on, on that concept and to move it forward across the NIH because we're a small part of what the NIH does. Um, we're working on a visioning process. We're coming to a combination of it. In fact, we're later this spring, we're having a couple of workshops to bring this to a closure, I hope. One of the issues has been what are outcomes that we're going to really focus on, something unique to minorities or disparity populations or something that we compare across populations. And these are what we're currently settled on. So obviously incidence and prevalence, um, some global burden of disease measure of which disability adjusted life years is a, as good as any and widely being used globally in global health. Premature or excessive mortality is obviously the ultimate outcome. And then some poor health-related quality of life, uh, daily functioning, using standardized measures, and I emphasize the standardized measures as uh, what patients think or what people think uh, matters. Then there are mechanisms of how people get there, and this is where we've tried to um, compromise or sort of blend different perspectives on this. So risks related to individual behavior, the biological epigenetic risks and that lead to faster progression. Um, there has been an explosion of information on the genetic side, on the biological side in the last 10, 15 years, and how do we fit that into the, into the model of what leads to health disparities? I think this is critical. There's the whole clinical event risks that adversely impact health, differential treatments that happen in healthcare, poor communication, adverse uh, events due to medications, falls, events that don't fall under a category of a diagnosis. And, and at NIH, often what happens in a clinical care setting isn't the central part of any of the institute's research. Diseases are, and clinical trials are, but not so much what happens in healthcare. And I think this is one of the areas NIMHD wants to uh, make a mark in in our own small way. And utilization of care, so lack of access, of course, we know about, but excess use or appropriate use of services from screening to, um, uh, to hospitalizations, readmissions, et cetera. So all of these things that um, I bring from my academic uh, medicine life, bring it to a research uh, lens uh, from a health disparities and minority health perspective. This is a sort of a simple graph of how I view this. Um, race ethnicity explains uh, independent variance in outcomes of uh, health disparities. Uh, social class explains independent variance, but it's not either or. Uh, it's not all about social class. I think that's become very clear in the last 30 years. When I started working in this field, the public health paradigm was it's all social class. Uh, and I think that's not the case, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that, but I, I'll be happy to address it. Our, our scientific staff at an AMHD um, came up with this uh, framework. Um, we published one last year uh, through NIA, the National Institute on Aging with Carl Hill and Marie Bernard and Norman Anderson that we developed while I was on their council um, for uh, four years. <clears throat> and this is a, a, it's sort of a, another direction of this is trying to, to put together the fundamental factors of race, ethnicity, and uh, socioeconomic status with the different components of levels of influence and also add the, uh, the cross the influence of not only the life course but also uh, the healthcare system and how important this is in determining this. And it's a framework to help people think about uh, health disparities. It's obviously uh, not all inclusive. Uh, but we'll, we're, we're continuing to work on this. Um, so in transitioning to what the topics might be, I want to emphasize uh, thinking about five ways that we can work to reduce health disparities in the healthcare setting. Um, I, I'll give credit to John Ayanian, who I heard speak on this uh, a few days ago, and it crystallized for me uh, some of these general themes, and then I'll show you clinical examples or data examples that I think would support this. So the, fun, the first and fundamental one is to expand access. Um, uh, this means, of course, health insurance. We have been going through the um, uh, uptake of the uh, Affordable Care Act in the last two years. Uh, the uh, uninsured rates have uh, dropped by half. You are all familiar 
that the uh, race ethnic um, distribution of uninsured meant that one out of three Latinos in the U.S. were uninsured prior to the ACA implementation. Um, and uh, comparison, about 13% of whites uh, uh, were uninsured in the U.S. This is below the age of 65. But we also need a place for people to go that functions. So systems can't just be, okay, come and see you know, 50 patients in a day. No, you have to have a place that functions. And clinicians. And again, I'm, I'm a general internist, so I have a fundamental belief that the primary care physician has to be the central factor in the healthcare system. That's something the United States has not um, yet um, embraced. Um, the, there has to be also, there are conditions where we have public health consensus on things. Um, and often you say, well, we don't need more data, we just need to do it. Uh, and you can think of uh, many conditions or many things that we, that we, we get a public health consensus and, and the randomized trial may show a, a slight improvement, but there's clear evidence that this benefits us and, and then we move forward. And I'll show you a couple of big examples of that. Um, Coordination of care has become increasingly important, and this takes a number of different manifestations. Um, the electronic medical record that we all love in clinical medicine, uh, of course, um, provides the template to be able to do a lot of the things that 20 years ago we said, oh, we should do this. Uh, and so we're in sort of the painful first uh, transition to electronic world but the, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, proverbially, and I think that it's up to us and our colleagues in, in system science and, and informa in informatics to really make this work. Uh, it will come, it will just take time, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see the fruits of it over time. But then other things like patient navigators, uh, patient advocates, um, targeting conditions, targeting things that we know need to be better, and rather than say, uh, oh, you're doing a great job with your patients, no, let's see how we do as a group. Uh, and I think all of these things that we're all kind of doing, uh, really to be much more systematic, to target the areas that we know uh, matter and that have had differences by either race, ethnicity, social class, uh, insurance, or different other factors. Um, and this also goes to, you know, high utilizers, um, conditions of that type. Mental health is a huge one that we have ignored for way too long uh, and that we need to step in and do a lot more with our colleagues in psychiatry and uh, behavioral health. Um, Patient-centered care. So what matters to patients? Do patients think or people think that what they're getting is good? And it's not just satisfaction and perceived quality, but you're delivering high quality. So the whole concept of the patient-centered medical home, which has had some mixed uh, evaluations, but clearly uh, brings the central point of what primary care was about 30 years ago, but now with an electronic health system that you can coordinate and get information and update on the group, on your population. Um, part of this is the whole effective communication part. And I always... Um, uh, would tell now uh, students and residents in, in, my, in my experience as an educator at UCSF that that was one of the hardest things in medicine is to be an effective communicator. And everyone kind of looked at me like, oh, are you kidding? Uh, the hard thing is to know all the differential diagnosis. And the information explosion and ability to look things up uh, at a fingertip, literally, uh, really changed that. But you can't do that with communication. And it matters so much at every level with peers, with staff, with patients, with families, and, and teaching that, and, and, and it really impacts outcomes. And under the rubric of cultural competence, I'll talk some about language access. And finally, there's the whole performance measurement. It is clear that if you measure something uh, for a system and, and the results are not good, uh, that the system will change. Um, the example of what happened when um, uh, he, uh, when uh, Jayco decided that oh, every patient had a heart attack needs to be on a beta blocker, and the rates went up, and the hospitals took care of it. It's 98 percent. Or people who had uh, hospitalized with pneumonia needed to have an O2 saturation measured, and uh, and things these things change. And and this is performance measurement. Whether there's money on the table or not, there is going to be more and more money on the table if the ACO model evolves in the direction that it is intended to evolve, and that depends on uh, what happens uh, later this year, 
um, ultimately, but uh, clearly that matters. Or systems decide this is what we're going to do. We're not, it's not CMS paying us, we're just going to do it. And the best example of that are the large HMOs in uh, Kaiser being a, good, a great example of that. So let me go through some examples of where these things matter. So this is a, a great example of zero randomized trials on why, uh, why we have lowered infant mortality systematically in the world over the last 150 years. No randomized trials, yet the obstetric package of whatever is done works. Um, nutrition, the population, better care for the mother. Yeah, and this is the U.S. And we, U.S. States gets a lot of flack for having bad outcomes in infant mortality. We're 20 something in the world. Um, but you can see that over the course of uh, the eight years here, uh, things have been moving in the right direction, particularly for the Puerto Rican population and the African American population, which have the highest infant mortality and have been resistant to improvement. Notice that Latinos, despite low socioeconomic status, relatively speaking, have an infant mortality that's indistinguishable from that of whites. And that's true for Latino immigrants as well as Latinas who were born here. So this is part of the, um, the minority health con concept that doesn't always lead to disparities. Childhood immunizations. Um, this is data from the CDC. And the, the good story here is that they're all high. And you say, well, they're not 100. By, well, it's hard to get 100% of anything, right? But they're, way, they're into the 90s. We don't see dramatic differences. There are significant differences probably in some of these numbers um, between different race, ethnic groups. So when we get a public health consensus and we have some resources to do it and you get a general agreement in the population, yes, we should do this, uh, things can happen. Um, hepatitis B, which I don't show a slide of, is about 70% at birth. And again, no race ethnic differences uh, in the United States. Switching to hypertension, this is data from um, uh, NHANES, uh, and we know the rates, they're higher among African Americans, uh, almost uh, over 40% of adults. Um, about three quarters of people are now treated with medications, and a little over half are controlled, which is a lot better than it was when I was in medical school um, many years ago. Um, being Latino, being black, being young or very old, uh, being poor or having less than a college degree, all are significant risks for having uncontrolled blood pressure. So clearly social determinants uh, are influencing this, education, young people, maybe some of that may be appropriate, but we know that there's a disproportionate effect in younger uh, African Americans, uh, particularly men. Um, and then having any insurance, Visiting a doctor or a clinician, an usual source of care lead to better control. So indirect evidence that primary care works and having access does make a difference. Um, now, just to mention that um, uh, hypertension is not uh, uh, equally uh, affects all population. This is our very interesting uh, results from uh, the uh, reasons for geographic and racial differences in stroke where essentially the bottom line here in a prospective cohort study, 10 millimeter elevation of systolic blood pressure uh, increased stroke risk by 8% in whites and 24% in blacks. Um, these are compelling information that uh, we've kind of known about clinically for a long time, but now well established with hazards ratio uh, that were significant at 2.38. Uh, for stage one hypertension and particularly affects the middle age, you know, the 45 to 64 year old group. So it brings up questions about, well, maybe we should be um, treating everyone the same and just driving the blood pressure as low as they can tolerate, or maybe we should modify it. So these are important. In blood pressure control on a national level, in this slide, uh, you can see that we have racial differences, as I highlighted before, being black or Latino. And uh, the uh, black group is the lighter blue color, I don't know if I have a, uh, is there a, one of these little things here? Yeah, okay. So these are blacks where you're under 50%. For Asian and Latino or Hispanic, you can see again, we're all under 50% uh, for total for men and for women. And for whites, it's 55, 54, uh, almost 60% in the case of women. So there are um, differences uh, in blood pressure control. 
This is not broken down by race, because I wasn't able to uh, locate national data for this, but these are data on hypertension control by risks. And we do best in people who have the least to benefit, right, the average risk. Uh, diabetics, chronic kidney disease, heart failure, any cardiovascular disease or Framingham risk over 10 percent. Everyone's, more people are being treated, but control, um, a percent not control is actually higher in those populations. Whether you accept or not the, um, the results of the recent trial that says more intensive therapy is needed, uh, this is using the, the criteria of 140 over 90. Yes, this can be done. And, Cal and Northern California Kaiser published a, a remarkably important paper in JAMA a couple years ago, uh, their experience of how they got 80% of their patients uh, controlled. And when you get to 80, you kind of hit a ceiling. They go from 80 to 90, and anything uh, is really, you got to put in a lot more resources. But 80 is a good, a good landmark. And what they did, they created a registry. You know, we can check, we can do that. Uh, they decided that here's how we're going to treat, and we're going to set a goal of under 140 over 90. And they used actually thiazide and ACE and not, you know, enalapril or benazapril. They, they weren't using any fancier ARBs or any other combinations of calcium blockers, et cetera. And they bought combination drugs, something that we rarely used in academic medicine, uh, because it was easier for the patients, and they got a good deal on them. They compared themselves to other California groups using NCQA metrics, and they went from 43.6% to 80% over the course of about a decade. Control versus 55 to 64 for comparison groups. Um, and the, the key issues were not just the registry, creating performance metrics, having guidelines. They also had open access uh, for the patients with hypertension to see, to get their blood pressure checked with an MA, a medical assistant. And then the medical assistant would communicate to the primary care doctor and say, their blood pressure really is up, what do we do? And they, or they had a protocol that they could follow um, in these combination pills. So I think this is a great example uh, of how a system change can uh, obliterate a disparity in a very diverse group of patients. Uh, There's a spectrum, you know, Kaiser doesn't take care of the most poor, uh, but this can be done in a county setting and a public setting. Uh, and they also don't take care of wealthy people. So it's the spectrum of, the, of, of America of that type. LDL cholesterol, again, we see differences by race, ethnicity. Um, whites at about 50% uh, treatment, controlled. Control is relative now if you believe the fact that if you're on a statin at any dose, you're going to make a difference. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. But you can see the amount of people treated, and you see the differences, not just by race, ethnicity, and this is only Mexican Americans because of the data set of H. Haines, of, uh, of uh, N. Haines, sorry, uh, but also an educational gradient that is um, maybe not as, uh, as uh, marked here in terms of, um, of treatment, but it is on uh, high uh, LDL, where you see college graduates having the lowest. Now, in this uh, data that I borrowed from uh, John, uh, John, uh, John Ayanian's work, um, highlight the fact that in looking at cholesterol control and Medicare HMOs, so Medicare Advantage and other HMOs by race and region, look what happened in the West. And, um, uh, you know, the mantra of the West is the best. Um, <laughs> I can't say that anymore, but I uh, still, uh, 06 to 2011, no difference. And yet across the country, uh, we see a black-white differential in control uh, both nationally as well as any of the other regions. And this is Medicare HMO. So, limp, you know, the regular fee-for-service Medicare has not been required to report these data until more recently, so there's no data to really analyze yet, although there will be. Um, so, again, this can be done. Um, you can make, uh, a, do away with disparities if you have a systems program that addresses the issues, you target a condition, and you put in uh, interventions uh, that are not, um, uh, that, that are within, well within our reach. Uh, and, and John's study also showed similar uh, results with glucose control. Um, prevalence of you know, colorectal cancer screening. Here's a, a topic that has robust randomized trials in, in showing decrease in mortality, let's say conservatively 20%, from colon cancer. Plus it actually potentially will have primary prevention by removing premalignant lesions in polyps. Um, so we've had a gradual, slow uptake of screening, 
And yet we see in the, these are the latest available data that we could get a hold of, of national data, uh, a gradient that's significant by race, ethnicity, as well as by uh, education. Uh, that is something we can do away with and have been able to do with. Divert for a moment to share with you the results of a study that John Inadomi did in San Francisco, um, a randomized trial of almost 1,000 patients where he offered them either fecal cold blood testing, colonoscopy, or their choice. And then uh, this is the diversity of the population that he worked with um, at uh, San, mostly San Francisco General Hospital, but also the Community Health um, Network in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and the outcome of interest was uh, how many completed colon cancer screening within 12 months. And these are the results. And it's not so much how high did the rates go, it's really the race ethnic differences in choice that I want to emphasize here. First of all, fecal cold blood test, perfectly acceptable way to screen, uh, had been ignored by most clinicians. Everybody was referring to colonoscopy, and the complaint in the clinic in the public setting was, we don't have, we don't have the access to colonoscopy, so people were waiting. But uh, it turns out that African Americans uh, or Latinos and Asians preferred uh, FOBT, and if you actually offered that, if you randomized them to that, they were more likely to be screened. When we gave them a choice, um, they were also more likely to have it done with um, with FOBT compared to, uh, to colonoscopy. And so the whole idea that people may, that by race, ethnicity, vary on their choice of screening when both are acceptable is one lesson. The second was we should do a lot more um, fecal cold blood testing and we'll get our rates uh, to go up across the board. In breast cancer, I think, is another example of success. Um, I know there are pockets of resistant groups that, you know, oh, the rates are 40%. And whatever you believe about mammography, uh, it is here, and it does, there's good evidence that it works. It's limited what it can do, but it works in terms of screening. And yet we see that, uh, except for American Indian, uh, Alaska Native population, the rates are over 80% screened in the last two years in the target group, age group of 50 to 74. You know, this is a public health success. Uh, and it is because of the public health consensus uh, based on good data and that people really put effort in getting this out uh, to the population. And even across education, there remains a gradient. It's not over, but it's not nearly the gap that we could have seen in the past. Um, again, in looking at uh, some of John Ianian's work uh, with related to uh, Medicare HMOs and traditional Medicare, uh, this illustrates how Medicare HMOs uh, are much better at uh, reducing uh, the gap of, uh, by race ethnicity than traditional Medicare. Not only are the rates higher, uh, but that the gaps between race by race ethnicity were, were much lower. And this is work he published uh, a couple of years ago in the Journal of National Cancer Institute. At UCSF, we did some work with uh, women of diverse groups and asked them about their screening and published this. This is all patients in clinics, both the UCSF um, uh, general medicine and family medicine clinics, but also the San Francisco General, the community clinic, the public clinic. And the rates for mammography were really high. The rates for pap tests were, were variable and the colon cancer screening were much lower. This is done about uh, 10 years ago or a little less than 10 years ago. Um, but we asked the women about perceived risk, and there were some interesting differences um, uh, that, that highlight um, in their risk, and this is in the case of breast cancer. Almost half of the Chinese women that we asked, mostly Chinese, uh, Asian group, um, said they had no risk. And so that's an interesting concept, that someone says, I have no risk, uh, really saying that. And yet we also see that the Latina and African American women, a disproportionate number, felt they were at moderate or high or very high risk. And believe me, at most, uh, there wasn't going to be, uh, you know, this level of, uh, you know, almost 40% or, or, uh, of, uh, of, of these women were going to be at the either Gale model or any other kind of model high risk. So what patients believe or think based on what they've learned uh, versus what the real risk is, is, you know, is a whole other topic. In, particularly in preventive medicine that, that needs to be addressed. And this is where we get into the issue of communication. Um, we have, I think, in the last uh, 20 years or so, developed a sort of gold standard that shared decision making is always the right thing to do. And I would challenge that that's the, necessarily the case. When you really look at prevention interventions, 
uh, particularly uh, cancer screening or immunizations, um, the really the absolute risk that someone has is so tiny. If you said, if I said to you, uh, you're going to need a colon cancer screening, and we do a colonoscopy for this, which nobody likes to hear about, um, and your your risk of dying from uh, colon cancer uh, is about five percent in your lifetime, right, if you were about age 50, roughly. Um, and if we do this test, you can lower it to three percent. Now, does that sound something that you could sell? Uh, absolutely not. I think somebody even, you know, will say, are you crazy? You want me to do that for that? Are you, uh, that's no way. But that we know there's, ab there's a consensus that this is an absolute benefit to doing this for the population and for obviously for... So I think in those considerations, you just say, we're recommending it, period. There's no reason to get into shared decision making. Now, if they say, well, I want to know the data, you know, you have an epidemiologist patient, uh, then, uh, <laughs> then you shift to plan B. Um, I think a lot, we, a lot of people have, we talk a lot about health literacy, which is critical, but health, uh, but numeracy is an important skill that many people lack, including uh, clinicians, uh, some clinicians. Um, and this absolute risk reduction is always what we need to focus on, and sometimes we can't because it just, you know, pap smear screening is another one. I mean, it's one in 10,000 risk of cervical cancer average risk. So how do you communicate that level of risk to anyone? Uh, it's really hard to conceive that. Uh, so that's a, an, another component here. I think that primary care doctors have a, a huge role to play in cancer survivorship, management of, uh, and this is a one model, um, management of all complex diseases that the specialists uh, now have succeeded in having people live. So all the transplant patients, um, this is maybe relevant to quaternary care, but no, not only. I mean, a lot of people get in kidney transplants, and it is a life-changing intervention. Cancer is also a big one. Uh, lots of survivors, uh, five-year survival rates have gone up. We're going for the moonshot now. Um, there's all these treatment side effects, the functional limitation, interpersonal disruption, quality of life gets disrupted. It's a chronic disease. Uh, breast, prostate, and colon are chronic diseases, uh, and and uh, the role here is not the oncologist. It's the it's the family physician and the general internist who are going to take care of these patients in the in the adult world, uh, because it requires coordination, complex, multidisciplinary care, and we that's what we do best. Uh, the oncologists really some oncologists might do it, but most of them are really not in that focus. I indirect data where this matters. This is analysis at a uh, a mentee of mine did uh, from University of Nevada. Uh, she looked at linked SEER Medicare data and showed that lack of primary care visits mattered to uh, associated with increased mortality for Latinas and white women who already had been diagnosed with stage one or stage two breast cancer. And the follow up period was a retrospective cohort over 10 years. And of course, not getting an annual mammogram was uh, associated with this. So. Both of things that primary care doctors can do. So see the patient, make sure that they're getting screened. And where is their follow-up going to be in these patients who are technically cured of their uh, stage 1, 2 breast cancers? And the, and the reason they're dying from breast cancer is because they got a second primary. Um, John, again, did this uh, research in Northern California a number of years ago where he asked women about um, the overall perceived excellence or quality of their overall cancer care and showed uh, a difference in perceived quality that was most dramatic for Asians. It had the lowest uh, perceived quality. Latinas were, were, uh, were almost as low, and then white and blacks were better. Um, the, the metrics of quality that we would normally take, like did they get the right chemo, did they get estrogen receptors tested, did they offer tamoxifen, were also slightly different, but not nearly this way. Um, and much of the difference that he found was a language factor, uh, which I think is a, is a critical one to, uh, and one close to my area of interest. Um, uh, let me kind of go through the rest more quickly. So smoking cessation is an area I'm very interested in. Uh, I think it's a pattern of uh, minorities of being light intermittent smokers. Uh, here again is a public health consensus. We've done policy changes, and we see smoking bans in U.S. households not uptake as much by African Americans, more by Latinos, as, a, as, a, as an effective way of getting people to quit um, that we as doctors can do. Um, 
this is secondhand smoke exposure from national, uh, again, from national data. Notice the progress from 1999 to 2008. This is an ultra-sensitive test for exposure to tobacco, so that whiff you get when you walk outside a place where people are smoking it will pick up and the cotinine will stay uh, in, your, uh, in your system for a few days. Um, and you notice that the rates have all dropped, uh, even among those below poverty uh, and among African Americans, which start off with the highest rates of exposure. Limited English proficiency is a big deal. I um, uh, don't need to tell people in New York that. Uh, and let me just share with you uh, perspectives on this. It's associated with less health information given to patients. Effect on clinical outcome does vary, but there is a clear shortage of clinicians who speak other languages. And language discordance is quite common. Interpreters are often not available. They're infrequently used and often uh, are not trained. They're ad hoc interpreters. And this is a problem of quality. Again, that we can make a difference by getting a system uh, engaged and making uh, an agreement that we need to do this. The gold standard would be language concordance, uh, which is not always going to be possible. And there are good data that uh, language concordant care tends to be more patient-centered when the language of the clinician, the fluency of the clinician, is truly fluent uh, in, in the language. Uh, these are indirect data that uh, my colleague in UCSF, Alicia Fernandez, published from Kaiser, showing that uh, concordant uh, Latino patients uh, with uh, either English or Spanish uh, had better control of their diabetes. I won't go over it in detail. This is a, a readmission study from Boston uh, showing that no interpreter, no interpreter doing a hospitalization was associated with a higher 30-day readmission rate than any interpreter use. And um, the interpreter use during the hospitalization tends to be episodic, so an admission and a discharge and maybe, maybe uh, one point in between. Um, we did a qualitative study uh, in, uh, in a primary care setting in a public hospital in the Bay Area looking at uh, interpreter-mediated um, uh, visits with, uh, with adult, with primary care uh, internal medicine uh, patients. Um, and that we categorize errors and the rate of the clinical significance. I won't go over the, all the details of the methodology, but the main results showed that you know, 29 percent of these text units, which are phrases that made sense, were categorized as errors. Uh, there were an average of 27 errors per visit. Um, over 60 percent of the errors had some sort of clinical significance, but the, significant, the clinically significant errors occurred in about 7 percent of all text units. It was one example of the instructions to take t acetaminophen were potentially going to lead to um, a, a toxic overdose uh, in the, the way it was uh, interpreted, and also a, a miss, a completely botched uh, interpretation of chest pain um, re with regards to the patient that could be, could could be very significant in terms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, video medical interpretation technology is really quite outstanding now. Um, the, on a tablet, we've used it in our clinics. It, it, it works. It gives you the sense of the interpreter being there, and it's much more efficient use of the human resources uh, for professional interpreters. In the hospital, the dual headphone is really the main thing that uh, has made a difference. Uh, hospital bandwidth often doesn't put up with the uh, with the video um, uh, as easily. Um, but the bottom line is that professional interpreters should always be used whenever possible. It's really about quality. Um, and systems need to make this commitment uh, to do this and, and support it. It is a, um, you know, a class uh, standard title, whatever, six, seven, um, that people should be able to get uh, language uh, accessible care, but yet there's no uh, enforcement of this. And JACO has been threatening to do something about this. I wish they would, because then that would get everyone moving on this. Uh, the dual head telephones work well. It does mean a language service. It costs money. Um, and if you see a, a limited English proficiency patient with an interpreter, you either uh, take twice as long or do half as much, right? Because two people are talking for everything, right? Uh, usually half as much gets done. Um, uh, and uh, language skills of clinicians should be considered uh, in these areas. It should be not only considered, but evaluated, tested. So you have to pass a test, uh, certified, and then compensated uh, in some way. Either you get more 
credit or RBU or whatever it is that your system is. And uh, I, I was pleased to see that UCSF was uh, getting there uh, as I was uh, leaving. So uh, in, in terms of recognizing this is important. Actually, the biggest barrier in the end was dealing with the um, uh, with uh, human resources in terms of union and uh, and the interpreters, but that I think they got they managed it. Um, more data on diabetes, uh, but uh, you know I'm gonna want to leave time for questions, so I'm gonna flip through these diabetes slides uh, quickly. Um, show you the visits are uh, pretty equal. We do see inferiority on a national level of glucose control and visits. Uh, driven, I suspect, primarily because the Latinos are uninsured and not for other reasons. If you, this first slide here showed that what happens with Medicare is you, once you get Medicare, the, the differences drop dra dramatically uh, and everyone, the, the glucose control gets better. Um, and we're aiming for just under eight uh, in these, in these uh, metrics. Uh, I'll skip these uh, slides, which are not, and finish with just my last two slides about an NMHD. So back to policy at NIH. Inclusion of minorities in studies has been confused with minority health, and it is not. It is an issue of social justice and common sense. So if I run a, a clinical trial and I say, I'm going to have 25% minorities, that has in the past counted as minority health research. But it is, uh, I don't know, let's say diabetes prevention trials, great example, wonderful trial, influential, 40% of the participants minorities, um, important disease that it, it leads to disparities, dis disproportionately affects uh, Latinos and African Americans and Asians in the U.S. But it is not minority health. It was a clinical trial to see whether this intervention worked, and it works across the board. It's great that they had minorities, and then we can say that categorically. And this confusion has been present at NIH for the last 15 years. We're going to try and end that this, uh, this year. The, the directors, uh, I think, are on board with this. So it's a third category of, of topics, inclusion of, my, of minorities in trials. You could say a fourth one is the biomedical workforce diversity. Uh, we are involved in all of them, but it's not the science. I mean, you could do research on how to improve diversity. You can do research on how to improve minority participation in research. Uh, and those are different kind. That it is minority health research, but the inclusion is only is not. And I think this is something that we want to. Right now, the NIH report says that we spend 2.5 billion dollars a year at NIH on um, minority health and health disparities research. We don't, I don't know if that's the right number or not. Um, most people think that's inflated. Uh, it may not be that inflated. We need to get the coding and the categorizations right in order to do that. And of course, the biomedical workforce diversity issue is huge. Um, it's worse for scientists than it is for clinicians. Uh, less than 5% of all NIH submitted grants are by uh, Latino, African-American, or American Indian uh, principal investigators. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's getting any better, uh, at least not in the short term. Uh, my last slide is to say what are new research areas that we're embarking on. Um, the first, oh, these are all approved concepts. Um, HIV study on youth, uh, so infected youth and young adults. Addressing health disparities among immigrants. Um, this will be coming out uh, a little later this year as a program announcement. Broad spectrum interventions, etiology. Disparities in surgical care uh, and outcomes. Um, and that will, uh, several institutes have signed up to that already. Uh, one on social epigenomics for minority health and health disparities. And then we are um, planning a workshop on health information technology and how that affects health disparities and minority health. Um, probably for the fall. We're going to revisit the phenotype-genotype question of race um, uh, in partnership with Genome. Uh, and the Health IT, the National Science Foundation is uh, already partnered with us, and we expect to have some partnership with uh, ARC. Um, and then uh, the one that's less, least developed right now, one on structural racism or institutional racism, and the flip side of that, uh, cultural competence. These are all intended to be scientific workshops, so we'll look at the field, see what we what questions there are, and where we need to go. So thank you very much for your attention, and I think we have time for some questions. So. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Boy, you really have your work cut out for you. 
I mean, what a what a topic and what a field, um, and and how much there is to be done. I I think, you know, you've done a really incredible job of sort of showing us the expanse, of of the the various ways in which we can um, look at minority health and health disparities. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Do we have any on that have come in online? Hello. Um, sorry. Hello. My name is Emma Ben. I'm a, an assistant professor in the Center for Biostatistics and Department of Population Health Science and Policy. Um, I guess, um, thank you so much for your presentation. It, um, one of the questions I have is, you talked uh, briefly in the beginning about this idea of identifying mechanisms and, and causes for these disparities. Mm -hmm. And I feel like from a statistical perspective, we kind of address that idea of kind of causes. We, we think that there has to be some methodological rigor by which, by which we do that. Um, in terms of thinking about causal inference more mm -hmm. generally. And one of the concerns as statisticians that we have um, is that we may be inhibiting progress that we can make with regards to disparities because of the way that we continue to design studies um, and the way in which we continue to look at and evaluate disparities. So for example, the idea that we're constantly showing different across group differences um, but that w those don't always serve as correct counterfactuals. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of the, the methodological areas that the NIMHD is kind of focusing on or how those of us who are very methodological uh, can kind of contribute to this discussion and if you're open to, to some of that uh, additional discourse. Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that even in another hour. Uh, but let, let me try to take a stab at what you're getting at. Um, so what I mean by etiology and causes is there's been an assumption in some groups that all of these uh, outcome differences are related to social factors, number one. And that if you address those, you took care of the differences. That's invalidated by the observations that there are people with low levels of education, poor, uh, who actually do better on the kinds of things that we see that do worse. And so there is an interplay that's going on. And as we've learned more, the social factors, and by that I mean the social determinants, um, uh, interact with your physical environment, with your interpersonal environment, your family, your culture, um, your network. So the power of social network is something that we've only really appreciated in the last you know, 10, 15 years, although anthropologists may argue that, well, we've known this for a long time, um, uh, with the biology uh, and how things change. So, for example, you may have a genetic predisposition for something, but unless you're in a certain environment, that will never get manifested. Uh, unless you get stressed uh, in your first three years of life, you may never develop um, uh, coronary artery disease or congestive heart failure at age 45 or 50. And we always assume, oh, we know what the etiology is of this, but I don't think that we know all the story. Or cancer is a good, you know, where you have a much stronger biological perspective. Now, you asked about methodology. You know, I've worked with statisticians my entire career, and I highly value their, their contributions. So well, what's the best research methods? Yeah, well, you answer a yes-no question, you do a randomized trial, which we can't do for, for many things. Uh, it prospectively collected observational data is very powerful at being able to sort this out. And one of the things I'll put in a brief plug in is the, the, the precision medicine initiative that is has been launched by the NIH, um, which has got a lot of buzz around the genomics and the omics and, and the biology of collection of data. But it, it's a tremendous, if it works, it's a tremendous re research resource for the future. If we collect data in a standardized way on a million people and follow them over time, what we will learn about diabetes and depression and lupus and and, and different uh, chronic conditions of adults, and I think event, uh, 
kids will be eventually engaged as well, uh, will be tremendous. Uh, independent of what we do in terms of the microbiome or the genetic, the GWAS or the different bio, uh, bio, um, biochemical markers that will be done um, and tested and looked at in subsamples or the whole sample as indicated. So I don't know if that gets at your, at your question or not. I think there's a tremendous value in thinking about this field to have um, physicians, clinician scientists uh, in the room with social scientists, with statisticians, uh, and population scientists. Um, the notion, uh, that this, you know, it seems like a broken record, particularly coming to an academic health center maybe, but um, it, there's still a lot of silos where people don't really interact and talk to each other. Uh, the behavioral social scientists are kind of on their own group. Uh, and they may have a lot of social scientists of different flavors, but they're still not, there's no clinician scientists involved. That's the biggest deficiency I think I see at NIH uh, is, not, uh, is, uh, is uh, clinician scientists and health services and that perspective uh, that at an academic health center I was used to. So, so I just want to take, uh, ask you a question myself. And, um, one of the things that, that was really impressive in, in your presentation sort of fits in directly with work that we've been doing, which is trying to figure out, you know, how you actually can take those lines that are often in parallel where people are getting better over time, but the disparities don't go away and kind of bringing them together. And one, a lot of the examples that you showed are really examples of where, you know, whether, whether it's Kaiser or somebody else, they actually explicitly put this on their agenda for something that they have to improve, right? And so they have these multimodal kind of interventions and they actually can reduce or eliminate the disparities completely. So, you know, but we're in a system that's so resource constrained that it, in a sense right now we're focused so much on outcomes and one of the concerns we all have is with all of this call towards outcomes that people are actually going to shy away from taking care of the people who are most in need and who start out with sort of the worst statistics because we're going to all be evaluated on what we can achieve in terms of, of these outcomes. So what, what do you see as sort of the role of research in maybe being able to sort of counter some of that? Right. Well, um, great, great point. I come from a, from a philosophy uh, that, that we don't do that. But you're right, the real world isn't that way, right? Um, the, um, there is, I think, uh, um, an, a current effort at the IOM to address some of these issues. And one of the suggestions has been that um, we risk adjust for social determinants in considering reimbursement. And I believe CMS is undergoing through some process where this is going to be con uh, considered and done. Um, I think that there are ways to uh, promote this within health systems. If one takes, uh, for example, uh, what does a health system really care about in terms of cost? They care about inappropriate uh, hospitalizations or emergency room visits because hospital, it's hard to get in the hospital unless you're really sick. Um, they really care about readmission rates because uh, those do get reported and those are something that they look at. So if you look and show and try to say, well, if you actually, one of the factors for readmission is that people weren't getting their, their prescriptions filled or they didn't understand their discharge instructions because they didn't speak English or their level of understanding of the complexity of what they needed to do was, uh, was not great. And you put in some mechanism to address that. You are addressing disparities at the same time doing something that the system is interested in. Um, high utilizers of emergency department during the day is, a, is another sensitive spot that they can sometimes say, a system will say, well, we'll we want to limit this. This is distracting. This is taking time away of our doctors to take care of people who come in really sick or with uh, acute illness. Um, and, and one way to do that is to make it more robust to see them in an urgent care setting or in a primary care setting and a way of decreasing disparities is often these are disenfranchised patients as well as uh, patients with chronic mental illness and the, the failure um, of our healthcare system in mental health is just atrocious and without addressing that um, 
uh, we won't we won't get very far in in some of these primary care and uh, and healthcare system disparities, um, and that sort of a, a cuts across the board. So if you have enough money, yeah, you can get mental health, or if you're willing to pay um, cash. But the, the fact that that is so hard to do uh, unless you're in the, and this is separate of the severely mental disorder patients, which there is a system to take care of them, uh, no matter how deficient it may be. So I don't know if that. You know, I, I think we have to pay attention to it and make sure that a doctor doesn't say, I don't want you because you're not taking your blood pressure medicine and your blood pressure is going to mess up my numbers. You know, I know that, that people say that happens. I, I do believe in um, the basic uh, humanistic um, um, philosophy of clinicians and that they, most of them won't do that. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I assume that you can't really... Uh, know that unless you have systems to monitor it and to make it very hard or impossible for people to do that without consequences. So, no, that's a good point. Uh, David Muller, thank you for an informative talk, and I apologize for having the mic at 9.05. Um, you mentioned the very beginning of the talk in the slide in passing uh, the different racial groups, and you mentioned heterogeneity, but only for a couple of them, for Latinos, for Asians. Um, not the heterogeneity of the African-American or black population right. or for whites, frankly. And then later on, you mentioned actually a couple of studies where that began to be more unpacked, who's Cuban, who's Mexican-American. Um, how much of a barrier is that to getting at the root cause of some of these health disparity problems or, or understanding minority health better that the NIH and all of us in clinical care continue, continue to use categories that are such broad brushstrokes and don't bother to understand Who's black? Who's white? Who's Latino, et cetera? Right. Thank you. Um, no, this is a critical point. Um, so there are a couple of philosophy issues from my perspective. Number one, if you keep dividing into smaller groups, you lose power and you lose leverage. So uh, for the folks who want to disaggregate everything, I say, well, then you're going to be a 1% in the wrong direction. Um, so I think there is power in grouping together for Latinos, for African Americans, and for Asian groups. That said, uh, I'm not, I am totally in favor of collecting uh, additional information, you know, country of origin, year of immigration, if you're an immigrant, uh, the social determinants in terms of social class, um, other constructs that are critical in understanding what's going on. Um, African Americans are heterogeneous. They're mixed with, uh, predominantly with whites in the U.S., uh, although also with other groups. Um, and the information on ancestral markers has given us the, a broader spectrum of what the level of that mixture that is. Um, it pales in comparison to the admixture of Latino Americans, where there are 20 generations of admixture from Europe, uh, indigenous people, and Africa, and then also some Asian admixture. And that's one of the unique populations in the world that have done that uh, historically. Uh, and therefore, it's particularly interesting from that perspective. Um, and yes, Puerto Ricans and Cubans, both Caribbean islands, uh, are different but similar. And there is, at the same time, a, a common language, a common culture, a common history uh, that brings Latin Americans closer together, particularly in the United States, when they're here as immigrants, uh, than they would otherwise be. So I think there is value to both aggregating and disaggregating. Uh, and understanding that. For example, Latinos from Puerto Rico and Cuba have a higher proportion of African admixture. Um, so doing some studies where we can look at African-American mixture influencing um, those Latinos compared to Mexicans that have predominantly 50-50 indigenous American and, and, and European um, would be interesting from an ideological uh, causal perspective as well. Um, and that's different in, in, Latin, in uh, the South America. Uh, one example I'll, I'll give you is uh, the, there is a gene that was identified by one of my colleagues at UCSF uh, that is uh, present in 15% of Latina women, predominantly Mexican, Central American background, um, and, uh, and this gene is protective against breast cancer. And maybe one of the explanations as to why Latinas have less breast cancer on average than, uh, than whites. 
Um, and uh, that's probably not likely to be present as often in, uh, in Latinas from Puerto Rico and Cuba because it is linked to indigenous background and there's much less indigenous admixture in, in those populations. So I think all of this is interesting and important to look at from an ideological perspective. Asian Americans have, Asians have a huge issue with disaggregation and they insist it's one of their banner topics from the Africa groups, and I think it's absolutely, you know, important. Um, there are 30 different languages. You know, South Asians are included in Asian when they're uh, they're actually also a very admixed population, um, uh, of which East Asian is a tiny amount. Uh, they really more more white uh, and African than anything else um, in in India and Pakistan. Um, uh, yet uh, Filipinos and Vietnamese and Southeast Asians are really underrepresented and underserved, uh, yet they're grouped together with Koreans and Japanese and Chinese, which generally are, are not underrepresented and generally have not been as underserved, although there are other kinds of barriers that exist for those populations, uh, of which include discrimination and language and, and, uh, and cultural issues that, that do matter. So I think this is all part of the, but if the census says these are the groups and they are actually supported by a consensus of science, of anthropologists, uh, geneticists, uh, um, epidemiologists, statisticians that sort of came together uh, towards the end of the 20th century about the geographic origin of, of what we call race in the, in the world. Uh, um, and those five categories have held up. Uh, they were just serendipity, I think, that the census got it right uh, in that regards. And Latinos are truly admixed. And, you know, like the Hawaiians, the, and Hawaii is a big admixture now, but it's a much more recent one. And India is actually probably 20,000 years, and, and nobody's really studied it uh, to figure, to, to get a, at that topic. So um, I think there is value in, in keeping aggregate groups and looking at aggregation because otherwise you get into sample size issue all the time. Um, uh, and then you get into small population uh, methods uh, and, and people were saying, well, we don't really know. But, uh, but there is a, we have to always be looking at different group differences within these race ethnic groups. Um, so we're gonna have to stop. I just wanna make one last comment and that is what a refreshing thing it is to have a primary care physician um, at the helm of, of such an important agency. Of course, I'm totally unbiased in that regard. But, but I think in your remarks, I just want to point out how unusual it is, because in your remarks, you really called out for things that absolutely can be done right now. Communication, recognizing disparities as an explicit issue that we have to deal with in every kind of intervention that we're doing, language access. I mean, there's real action items right here based upon the research that you showed. And so I think for those people who are saying, why can't we just do something? I think you, you called out, from your perspective, you already called out things that could really be done to help us um, in that area. So thank you very much, and thanks for everybody for coming. Thank you.